comes in And before we rest there's three towns more The sun is going down And my legs are growing stiff And I'm wondering what we've let ourselves in for Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Dead Men Talk. And with this part of the series, you know, since I've come back after a little bit of a break, I've stopped talking about myself and I'm going to start having a lot of very, very interesting people on. And today's is no exception. No exception. Um, multi-instrumentalist, uh, singer, songwriter. He is the guy behind two of the albums who that are on my playlist constantly at the moment. Um Chasing Down Wolves and Here Be Dragons. I welcome Matt Steady to the show. How are you, mate? Hey, Chris. I'm well, thank you. Yeah, good, 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 good. It's a pleasure to have you on here, mate. Thank you for, for coming on. Because uh, oh, Chris, it's lovely. I, um, as I, you know, the, 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 my series as it, as it was when I did it last year was really about my writing journey. And not a lot of people know this, not sound like Michael Caine. Um, but my when I first started writing, it was song lyrics. So music has very much been a massive part of my life up to when I discovered writing books. And, you know, just talk to yourself being I'm not going to go too fanboy on you because I don't want to embarrass you. But, you know, your <laughs> your music I, I th- is so fantastic. You know, I, I really have connected with it. Oh, and I just really great. I really want to find out more and introduce you to to, to <laughs> more people who may not know you and your music. Uh, but just to find out really more about your inspirations, you know, where it all comes from and, and, you know, anything else that you can tell us about yourself along the way, really. So, you know, sit tight, really. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the, the, uh, the ideal place to start, I know there's a song in there somewhere, but let's start at the beginning. Um, when did you, you know, what were your influences growing up sort of music wise? Where did uh, it all begin? Well, I mean, I was, I was brought up on classical music. Okay enough um my dad loves classical music um but we also had um some gospel music black gospel music we had um, louis armstrong um cool. we had uh, grief we had tapes of the muppets and sesame street in the car i remember that very yeah well. we had that as Terrible well loads. can't be that but you know came from a church background so there was singing all the time and um at the time um my parents were part of the Salvation Army, so there's brass bands and choirs, and there's just music everywhere, really. Yeah. My dad was actually very good at the piano, very good, much better than I ever got. Um, and um, they encouraged me, um, I'm not sure encouraged is the right word, <laughs> um, signed me up for, might be more honest, um, <laughs> violin and piano lessons when I was um, at primary school. And mm-hmm. I carried those through right to the end of secondary school and um, kind of well, I got pretty good at them, um, but I I'd found guitar probably when I was about thirteen or fourteen, and for me, although I enjoyed playing piano and violin, guitar was something completely different. I, I started learning by ear instead of just the kind of notes on the page, and uh, and I had so much freedom. I could learn whatever I wanted, not just what the teacher gave me. I could yeah. try and play like different people. I could make my own style, and I could oh my goodness it really was just felt like freedom it really did and um and yeah kind of took it from there really i'm very very grateful for my background yeah. I've learned classical styles it comes in so incredibly useful and of course i'm playing my violin again these days awesome. um, so i think the last i think i picked it up when i was 39 i picked it up again wow uh, i've been playing it for another seven years after that and it, it took a little while to come back, but I uh, came back with vengeance. And yeah. But now I play my violin in that kind of free, improvised style that I found with the guitar that suits me so much better than just yeah. playing what everyone wanted me to play or told me to play, you know. So, yeah, yeah great that's, stuff. That's one of those instruments that I, I always, in my head, I would love to play. But I know it's one of those which you, you see it um, often, you know, in... <laughs> You know, TV clips or whatever when they're making fun of it people learning the violin is painful sometimes to listen to I would probably would be that person um, but when I hear it it's it's really it, it, that's the one instrument really next to the guitar that would really grab me in because I think it just adds so much to um, yeah. to the depth and of the I, I love string instruments because they're so 
um, connected to the musician. Mm. I mean, the there's so much expression with both hands that, that go into making the notes and it's never perfect. And that's kind of one of the delights about it. Your, the intonation is never perfect. Um, the, you know, you always hear both scrapes and squeaks and, you know, even people vastly much better than me is never perfect. And that's part of the beauty of it. It's those little imperfections that just, make it sound like a real instrument with someone really actually playing it, you know, and you're never going to capture that with MIDI and stuff no. like, you know what I mean? It's... No, you can, you can, you can doctor music too much. And I think that's the, that's, uh, that's the danger with, especially with the digital age, you know, anyone can be a musician if you've got the right apps these days. Definitely. And, um, and actually, I mean, it's the same with auto tune, isn't it? I mean, uh, you can, there's a place for, for all of it. I auto tune on occasion. No, oh, let me no, let me rephrase that. I use software that can be used for auto tuning on occasion. Right. And I, and if I've done a fantastic vocal take that I really really love the passion and everything in it, mm. but actually there's a couple of notes in there that mm, that's yeah. going to distract the listener from connecting with it, then I will manually tweak a couple of notes, for instance. Sure. So there, there are times where I choose the passion of a take over the perfection of a take. Yeah, and then occasionally I will tweak it to make it a bit more palatable to a listener, if that makes any sense. Because awesome. yeah, yeah, because if, if you sing and um, live, you don't need to. People, when you hear things live, your brain doesn't expect them to be one hundred percent perfect. Yeah. And and actually, if you listen back, to, if you go to a gig and it's fantastic, the singer was amazing, and you listen to it back recorded, you'll think, oh, they're out of tune there. That's yeah. not right. Oh goodness. But you don't hear it when it's live. It's no. something, there's something about it being recorded and coming back through speakers into your head. Yeah. And yeah. you spot all these things. And actually, they weren't bad. They were fantastic. Yeah. But sometimes when it's recorded but when played back, you kind of get these little things. Um, so, yeah. You've got the atmosphere at a live gig as well. I think you don't pick up on any of that because it's just... The, and it's you're, just not, awake action. you're never going to yeah. get that with a speaker. Uh, oh. I mean, every gig you do, um, you know, even those gigs where you can't as you see you've got lights in your eyes and you can't hear anything because the music's loud but you know people are there and there's still a feeling in the place and you're still communicating with people yeah. and you do get feedback back and it's a two-way process you then sing and play based on how they react to you hmm. um and it kind of builds up and it's the whole thing's much more powerful than if you were playing that's uh, you know i've done some um live streaming of gigs and stuff like that um yeah. you know as everyone has done, done in covid i mean i was doing it before that mm. actually yeah. i've kind of haven't done much of it during covid just because everyone else was really and okay. <laughs> fair enough um, yeah yeah but yeah. It, it's really hard doing it without that feedback yeah that's yeah. going to be one of my questions actually is how you know further on down you know skip forward to, to now in the last sort of 18 months is how it's impacted you i mean obviously you've not been able to get out there live you know how have you made it work or, or did you just kind of hold back and thought i'm just going to launch back into it when i can well i think the first thing is i love gigging i really do um it's, it's a very it's very special when you get it right it's, there's nothing better than it mm. uh in terms of the income that i make with my music gigging is really really low on the list yeah. it it's very hard to make any money gigging. Um, well, at least I haven't found it. If anyone's got a magic <laughs> way, then uh, please do tickle me up and send me an email and I'd love to know all about it. But uh, it generally is actually very, very hard work um, mm. for, it takes a lot of preparation. You know, even if you know the songs backwards, you, it takes a lot of prep and the financial returns are pretty slim, to yeah. be honest. Um, so generally these days, um, I do the ones I want to. So okay. if a venue asks me to play and I like the venue, I'll play there because that's great. Or if someone yeah. wants me to come play violin for them while they do their, you know, while they're playing mm. um, and I like them, I'll go and play with them. That's great. So I, I choose them because I want to do them rather than, um, you know, I, I've chosen not to go to five pubs a week and sing Wonderwall. Yeah. You know, that's, it's just yeah. not what I want to do. I've got, I've got a whole herd of children here. <laughs> and, it, um, and the last thing I want to be doing is spending all my evenings Sure. Wonderful. There's, 
if I have a special gig, then I love it and I go to it and I thoroughly enjoy it and I put my all into it and I make sure it's going to be bang on and yeah. put all my energy into it. But I don't do that. I, you know, I don't do a huge amount of it. No. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so, you... during the, so during COVID, really. So what I'm saying is really, it didn't impact from that point of view. No. Um, I've released, well, nearly released two albums during the during the last two years Impressive. of COVID. Um, so the first the first one, I, I did a Celtic Instrumentals album. Because, I mean, I'd been, before COVID, I'd been smashing my head against, you know, not against, but with the music. I being being trying to make my money from music it's really really hard yeah um and the problem is you think if i take five minutes break that could be the five minutes that meant that i couldn't continue doing it sure you know if i take my foot off the gas pedal if i don't produce music if i don't keep in social media if i don't do this that, yeah that, um then that might be the reason that i have to give it up and go back into working for the man you know uh, so if you're not careful it's very easy to burn out and actually we got covid we got locked down and i just needed a rest so mm-hmm. i started just improvising most on the violin actually i put i didn't touch the guitar for blooming ages mm-hmm. uh, and just started improvising recording some stuff and slowly the sound came together and it's it's it was just a way of um relaxing kind of centering myself again and mm. just kind of getting back to who i am and what i do and um i kind of needed that i think um it was you know, the first lockdown in particular was quite yeah stressful really and i think a lot of people kind of connected with it because everyone yeah. else needed it as well it was and i think a lot of a lot of musicians do covid albums you know and they all put their own take or spin on it but yeah. it's just having that authentic voice from what you're feeling and what what makes the music you know yeah. what i mean i don't i don't go out and think right what do my audience think about about lockdown let's write an album is is it really a time that you you want to be remote i mean we're never going to forget it but is it is it something that you want to immortalize in an album or you know well it's not spin it's, it. it's, it's a it's an album for anyone that just needs to it's, I mean, it's. Yeah, I mean, my my daughter doesn't listen to my music. My oldest daughter, Indigo, she's twenty one. She, uh, you know, she sings with me at gigs and stuff like that. Oh, but she never put one of my albums on. It, you know, it's dad's <laughs> music. But she she loved it because um, she put it on while she was revising for a um, for her university exams, and okay. she said it was perfect for that. Yeah. And I had other people meditating to it or or uh, having it on while they were praying. Yeah. I had all sorts of people doing all sorts of stuff with it on in the background and, and you know people found it helpful so um yeah it's it's, it's kind of oh, yeah. it's kind of good. so it's not really a covid album it just happened to be it's it's your byproduct doing. of it i suppose everyone's gonna have their own version of that as well you know it's it's how create creativity comes forth did you find that you were more or less inspired in that way during that time did it have any impact on sort of the ease of it um uh, i my music is interesting from that point of view because it's easy. I don't know. Um, most of the time, I get the germ of an idea for a song, and it's and it starts off pretty easy. And some songs just come together, and you just think, "Ah, oh, I got it." Other songs, you end up for months just battering away at the lyrics. As you find one line, you just can't get the idea across, or yeah. you can, but it doesn't scan, or you know, you just. And sometimes you, it feels like work and you're battering away at it. And, but when you get it, that's, that's great. Um, but I found the improvisation was, I mean, I literally just put a mic there, got my violin out, pressed record and just went bam. And just whatever came out, I recorded. And then I kind of pieced bits together and I thought, oh, I like that. And actually, I'd probably say 75% of the um, violin on that album is, and it's mostly violin driven, um, mm. is actually from those sessions. I didn't some of it I had to re-record but very little of it I just put it in some of it I had to re-record to fit to a beat and yeah. put everything behind it and all that but so that was kind of easy the difficult bit is then piecing it all together getting all the other instruments around it and mm. making it to making it into an album and then you've got the production phase which just goes on forever you know it's, it's you've almost got an album and it's listenable but then it takes you another three months to make just to yeah soften all the edges off and take away the jagged edges and 
and make it so it's actually a, a listenable album for other people as well. So, so, so yeah. you, you do all the production yourself as well? Yes, as I well do. As, yeah. I'll tell you why, it's because I'm cheap. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, as you know, at the end of the day, my budget, I don't really have a budget. It's um, my money coming in minus the money going out. I, yeah. I just try to make everything as, as cost-effective as possible. Plus, yeah. I love it. I yeah. love learning new techniques. I love um, listening to stuff. I love getting better. I love learning. That, you know what I mean? And so, um, yes, I do all the production, the mixing, the mastering. I do all of that on there. I play most of the instruments as well, although um, I usually get a percussionist um, dr or a drummer involved. Cool, cool. And, um, last few albums I've been playing with Tell Bryant, who's an extraordinary uh, drummer and percussionist. Um, and I've been going to his gigs with Iona and places um, since I was a teenager, I mean, we're talking ages ago. <laughs> I was probably about 30. Um, so to actually get to play with him now is, is fantastic. And the, the latest album um, we've actually done as a band album with him and um, one of his bass friends and myself. And that was, that was really, really good. So that, I've done the pre-order to that, actually. It should be coming. The CDs apparently are in the post. Oh, so I deal. Yes, yeah, it's really, That's really good. Cool. Uh, there you go. Do a little, do a little plug for it. Let everyone know. Sort of when is that? What it is? Where we can find Okay, it. the new album is called New Burying Ground, and uh, the the band name is The Grace Machine. So it's that's me, Matt Steady, and Till Bryant on uh, drums, and percussion, and Matt Weeks on bass. And in certain circles, cer certain circles, they are very well known musicians. So it's an absolute mm. pleasure to play with them. Um, all of the songs in the album are either written um by um uh written by black slaves prisoners um or are inspired um by that kind of um environment um some were from the early black gospel churches so again it wasn't i didn't think i'm going to go out and make a um black lives matter album but it was definitely <laughs> on my mind when i was when i was thinking and this mm. kind of the second lockdown the the thing I just needed was a bit of hope. Sure. Uh, you know what I mean? It's just yeah. things still going on. I, yeah. You know, and if anything, it seems to be speeding up. And, you know, at the end of the day, um, list, I was started listening to some very old um, field songs um, that people would have sung in the fields. Hmm. Um, slaves and some of them very early recordings sung by prisoners in um, various... Uh, prisons in America and oh my goodness they give you shivers up your spine it's just yeah. uh, it's just incredible a lot of it I think isn't very accessible to everyone these days if you if you put some of those songs in front of the majority of people I think they'd find it interesting but I don't think they'd want to listen to it for very yeah. long um, you know it's, it's 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 so rough but there's so much passion and that kind of mix bittersweet mix of um pain and hope um is fantastic um you put your own spin on it as well oh like, gosh yeah i mean i i listened to um uh, new burying ground and it's you know you this is one that i can't pin you down to a genre that no you sorry kind of to. no that's fine no i mean that's brilliant. I'm, I'm terrible for marketing how do you market <laughs> someone who changes you can you can have multi album. multiple places in hmv it's fine so it's probably yeah that's it <laughs> But, um, but it's like because I, I uh, since I've moved down to Devon, became quite a big folk fan, especially the the guys from around here, Seth Lakeman, Show of Hands, and that. Oh, so wonderful. those guys are just have been such a massive influence on me. Yeah, yeah I, I, I I don't think you can get. I mean, down there, I'm quite biased again, being down this way. Yeah. But they are okay. they are the ones I always gravitate back to, and I think the thing that grabbed me with your music is a lot of it is it, very much like that so instantly hooked me in but then new burying ground is like you know something worthy of joe bonamassa because it's so bluesy yeah yeah you know? it's and yeah. It, i mean it's it, what i that's what i found sort of going through your back catalog and that is is if you change it up i mean even on the same album you can have you know two or three different sounds um, i've tried i've tried to stop doing that quite as much i mean the first album when you got there behind you uh yes. blood is thicker than gold i mean that was really oh my goodness you can record stuff at home. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and then I just, I just 
I started writing songs for the first time in my life and I started recording them for the first time in my life. And of course, they were just a mixed bag of what should I do today? <gasps> Let's do a country and western song. Let's do a blues <laughs> song. Let's do a, a Celtic instrumental song. Oh, yeah. what else can I do? And I, and I ended up with this big bag of songs and ended up putting them on an album. <laughs> I mean, but, I mean, does it hang together? I don't know if it does or not really. But um, as I've kind of gone through, I've, I've, my style changes for sure. Um, mm. I've tried to make a conscious effort to make each album hang together a little bit better than that first one, if that makes any sense. I do love that first album. It's got some... I say, it's a phenomenal of... album. So, I mean, if you feel that you've done better with others, I mean, it, it really does sort of show people who've listened to it, you know, how much how much your music's grown and how good your stuff is. Because... Well, I, think, I think the thing I've, I've tried to do after the first couple of albums really was to think right what is this album as you saying so rather than having i mean if you're having a if you're at a, a great restaurant um your different courses should mm. kind of match and complement each other yeah so if a, if a chef was designing a dinner for you you know it'd probably be different than what we'd pick um <laughs> so uh, you would you know you wouldn't have curry when then something really delicate for <laughs> you could would you not really no I, i'm probably describing this really badly but um, I know what you mean. in the old days you'd call it a concept album but my last few albums have been concept albums really mm. i mean um chasing down wolves was actually a a story and all the songs put together and made a story and um i kind of tried to leave it as some of it's really obvious but some of it is just what do people want to make of this story you know mm where do they what what do they think has actually happened to kind of give you the bones of a story and, and the people can fill in the dots and color in the picture yeah. um but i i definitely purposely thought so then you've got the music but then you've also got another layer on top which mm. can add something um but i mean from the classical stuff that was rife anyway um you know you've only got to listen to host the planets or something like that you know it's um or uh, well, yeah, and I think um, Prog does that very well um, in places, which is, yeah. which is why I love a bit of Prog as well. I love most things, to be honest. I, I, why not? It's a bit prog isn't something that I got into, but like all of my mates seem to have sampled some of it. So it's one that kind of... Some of it, I mean, basically, by, but... some of it I find fantastic. I mean, mm. probably one of my favourite bands is Meridian. And okay. know, they've been going donkeys over here. Um, most people haven't heard of any of the stuff they've done since Kaylee, which is about 40 years ago or something crazy. But, you know, they've done some amazing, amazing stuff. And they've done the best gig that I've ever been to. I've been to a lot of good gigs, but theirs was, it was out of this world. Absolutely yeah. stunning. Um, but I do find there's other prog bands that seem to be so very clever, so many notes and so many techniques. And you almost think you've, you put that in there because it's a good technique and it's, mm. and it's clever rather than actually listening to the song and working out what needs to happen to the song to make the song better. Sure. So, so, so I do find some prog a little, little tricky from that point of view. It's very, it can be very intellectual, but it doesn't give me a, um, that kind of, it's not spiritual, but that spiritual experience, that yeah. whole experience. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Okay. <laughs> Going, going back to what you were saying about obviously the like makeup of albums and things like concept albums, they tell a story. I, I'm, I absolutely love listening to, I'm pretty old school. I look, I prefer listening to an album as an album, yes. particularly if it is like that. And it tells a story. I, um, Chris Debo is one of my heroes, which my wife just cannot stand, <laughs> unfortunately. But I mean, it's not necessarily, it's, it's his older stuff because his older albums, they all had a story that he was oh, telling. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, nowadays how do you feel that the music industry and particularly the digital age treats albums like that you know because it's so easy just to dip into spotify and select a song do you think that it's it's taken away that element or do you think it's added more to it now uh i don't think any of my children have ever listened to an album all the way through by their own choice i think does that answer your question generational thing probably it's all playlists but to be honest it's so easy now they rarely listen to a song all the way through yeah that's good um and i think i i find that a bit sad to be honest um yeah. and, 
if you listen to a song and it doesn't hook you in 10 seconds, it's literally goodbye, next song, yeah. song, next song. Oh, I'm getting a bit bored with this. My attention span's only 30 seconds. Well, let's listen to 30 seconds of this song. Oh, what's next? Look at that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, it's There's too I, much I, choice. I'm streaming, I'm, I've, I've got so much, I, I'm, I'm so divided over streaming. Yeah. It's, I really, really am. I think it's teaching the wrong things to children for a start my children um <laughs> because no. they're not learning to experience music no um no. and it's not i wouldn't say what they listen to is music um just because of the way it's um just the way that they actually consume it yeah um, and i mean i'm not even going into the money side of streaming or any of that i, I just find that really difficult but person mm. but I, i'd stream i've got a spotify um subscription which actually i got it because um uh we uh, i don't know if you know we adopt and foster that's our that's one of our oh, okay. things. we've oh. got six kids and we've got two three three of them adopted and two are fostered um and so we got a kind of family subscription for spotify so that when we've got long journeys yeah. they can all put in their headphones and then we don't yeah, have to go we've done the oh, same thing well, yeah uh, and it's it's for them it's fantastic you can put them in front of the computer they can make a playlist i could put it on their machine and yeah. it's it's great um from that point of view and in the car i'll often put spotify on mm. and i've got a list of albums that i like but i still listen to them in albums i don't listen yeah. to playlists or switch yeah. between something well, i'm driving i'm not switching between anything i'm putting <laughs> on this album and hoping it goes on as long as possible so i don't have to I still use a lot of CDs to be honest in the car. Um, for yeah, sure. yeah. I I, much, I used to make my own like mix CDs when I was like either commuting or doing you know yeah. um, long journeys or whatever. And I've still got the folder of it in my car. Oh, amazing! Mainly because the car I bought last year it doesn't. It's not great on Bluetooth because it's a little bit older, but it's fine. You know, it's it you just stick something in. I I I feel I can see my kids doing it because they obviously they get onto Netflix and stuff. I remember back when I used to watch TV, I used to have like one or two videotapes that I used to put in over and over again. And yeah. they've just got hundreds, hundreds of shows out there of the same as Spotify, hundreds of songs and artists at their fingertips. Um, I, you know. I don't really feel like they value them as much. No. I mean, no. There's, there's songs and albums to me that are literally life-changing and I'm not exaggerating. They have no. literally changed my life. Yeah. Um, and when I listen to them, they just take me back to different places that I've been, yeah. to, pe to people I, I know or knew uh, what we were doing. I can picture, you know, where I first heard it. Yeah. Uh, you know, and these, it's so special to me. I, and my kids love music. They have it on a lot. Mm. But I don't think they've got any, I have to be fair, they're not as old as me maybe no, it's true. <laughs> but i don't think but no i don't think so i think when i was their age i had i had these oh my goodness when i first heard a beatles album after being brought up on classical music yeah oh, <laughs> what it's is this well. straight was next um i mean big rambling long long albums and you just listen all the way through I and mean, you weren't going to skip on a record were you I'm gonna no no it. Uh, you well, know and i don't think they've got anything like that i don't think they've got any uh, precious music no no because i mean i know i mean my kids i, my, my, I failed as a dad no, no. <laughs> it's the generation i blame i blame the times i mean my my son bless him i mean they're both getting into metal music that's what me and my missus have, have kind of nice. big yeah. into folk music's my other thing but metal has been our shared sort of thing but yeah. my my little boy's very into alice cooper Oh really? Um, oh, well so, done there. I yeah, so. yeah, yeah. I mean, at the moment, he's only about sort of he only listen to six or seven songs. We're trying to broaden them a little bit, you know, knowing that the guy's got like forty or fifty years worth of music, um, so he's got a lot of learning to do. Um, but again, he it's trying to get him to listen to a whole album. Their attention span just isn't there. Like, you know, they come across a song he doesn't recognise, he'll gladly get, skip past it. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, we used to sit there. I'm sure he's the same as you, but. Um, you'd get your dad's records out or you'd have your tapes mm. and you'd sit there in front of the stereo and you'd be looking at the cover and you would sit there mm. and the only thing you were doing was listening to the music and looking at the cover yeah and yeah. perhaps looking at the lyrics i mean 
no one in their right mind would do that these days, would they? They no. kind of a kind of a laptop um, with it streamed on with some tinny speaker. <laughs> And they'll also have their phone, and they'll also be messaging their mates, and they'll also, and you don't get that. It's background noise. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. you know. And I I love the fact that my kids love music, Um, and the older ones, I would say, um, they've got some albums they love. Don't get me wrong, but the 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 younger four, not really. They just there's time. They've got they love and a pop too, but it's it's not quite. So, but yeah, people aren't satisfied with one. You know, yeah. they'll be watching TV and they'll have another screen and then another screen. And yeah, yeah. you've so, got to be watching three screens at once. What's going on here? If you, um, if you had to pick out some of these albums that really sort of take you back places or that mean most to you, what, what would they be if you could pick, I don't know, sort of three just to, out of the air? Oh, um, I think Dire Straits Alchemy. Um, I mean, that was just, I'd never heard anything like it. It was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, Marillion clutching at straws. I remember I went on a summer camp. It was one of those uh, in the Lake District where you end up doing kayaking and rock climbing yeah. and all that kind of business, which looking back was fantastic. Uh, wasn't keen on the abseiling. No, no, I've never, never done anything like that. Um, but I mean, fun, you know, you go away for a week and yeah, uh, you give your parents a rest. I believe. I believe that's the main reason. <laughs> I think we um, and you do all these activities and lots, lots of walking and swimming and all that. And yeah. they back at base, they had a room with a table tennis table, and someone put. In fact, I the two albums I remember on this particular holiday there was Marillion Clutching at Straws, which was just mind-boggling, really good. Mm. And there was also um, Alana Miles with Black Velvet. That was oh, the other okay. Two. Yeah, so they only had two takes. They were playing these over and over and over, and it kind of got mm. my psyche. <laughs> um, I think another album that really, really spoke to me. Oh, I could talk like this forever, <laughs> but I'll give you one more. Yeah. It was um, Gretchen Peters' Blackbirds album. Okay. Uh, which is she's no, oh, she, she sings country, yeah. country, oh, yeah, maybe American folk. Okay. Would be, um, country to 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 me brings up um conjures up all sorts of um ideas with and sound ideas and lyrical ideas of mm. which most of them i'm not that keen on okay so if but there's some very very good country artists that i love that re- i would call american folk and then i feel a lot more happy about it so jeff black that's a hell of a diplomatic way of saying talking around that well done i like it yeah it's, it's difficult, isn't it? I, I, i'm sure they don't like my music either. <laughs> um but this gretchen peters album blackbirds um I mean, we had a very sad um family event happen when my nieces died at the age of four uh, wow. in a traffic accident and i had to drive quite a long way to see my parents to tell them because you didn't yeah. want to tell them on the phone want to sort of be there when you know, they found out you know tough 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 times you know it's a long time ago now but it was tough times and i just got this album through the post and i hadn't played it and on the way down i put it in the car and it just spoke to me it was just perfect for what i was going through yeah. the lyrics the sounds the tempo everything it was just made for that moment and it kind of started the healing process before I even knew it if that made any sense because sure. you've got so much going through your head you don't even know what you're thinking you don't know what your problem what the problem is you don't you can't yeah. your brain can't work it out you just you yeah. go into autopilot and you do what you have to do and you do what you're told to do and you sure. say things you've got to say but there's no you're kind of almost your free will almost just disappears it goes mm. and you go into this shell where you just do what you're meant to, what yeah. you have to do function yeah that's it that's it and um and this got underneath that kind of <laughs> into my yeah. into my inner being and kind of woke it up a little bit and it um and I just listened to it non-stop for about a month and it could just continued speaking to me really yeah. and you know bless the correction Peters will probably never know what that meant to me you know and that's that's, that's, that's one of those things but, as an artist that you you I think makes it worth it whether you know it or not yeah. at the time you know is to, is to have something out there that does that 
Yeah, and occasionally you get a message from someone who's been listening to your music, it's been helping them get through something rough, mm. and you just think, oh my, that's that's mm. much more precious than yeah than earning money at a big company. Yeah, you know what I mean? Absolutely. I did twenty years at a, a big company working for someone else, and um, I, I don't, can't imagine I'll ever go back. <laughs> you know what I mean? No, well, um, fingers crossed fingers crossed so let's go back to your music um for a little bit so you touched on the inspiration that you had for new bearing ground for example i mean your other albums that um to take the ones that are sort of the more concept albums and that are these um are these ideas that sort of come out of nowhere for you or, or do you just kind of write a load of stuff down and then when you get the chance you kind of go and you, you see what comes out what's your creative process like it's different for each album um, very much is um, chasing down wolves came about because I well two things really I'd just been doing a lot of reading on um, Saxons and Vikings and King Alfred and you know it's just a fascinating part of history and I was mm. really doing a load of digging into that just for my own amusement I hadn't thought of it being any music um, and my good friend John Reed who I do gigs with and uh, we kind of found each other's albums and things like that he plays an instrument called a, a sittern yes. which, uh, ah, i thought it was in a box i thought i packed it i haven't got there yet i have my own wow. it won't be in tune or anything but but it's got 10 strings and they're in pairs a little bit, like, little bit like a mandolin, but a little, a little bit like a mandolin, yeah. but a lot bigger. Yeah. Um, and um, you can really thrash it, or you can caress it, and it gives you different sounds. Okay. And John is a, a really good Saturn player, and um, I borrowed his second Saturn. <laughs> right. got a one. So um, I borrowed his his first one, which didn't have a pickup. Um, so he bought one. You've got a nice new one made. Oh, it's gorgeous. And yeah. it's got pickup, so he uses that. And I, I got this and I have some microphones. Okay. <laughs> to be honest, it's probably not a bad way of doing it. These must, no. Uh, and I just started playing this thing and I'd been playing, you know, the, the kind of history stuff. A lot of my stuff is based on history anyway, but that, it, yeah, it started coming together. I wrote a few songs and I thought, do you know what? There's a common theme going through here. And actually, you could. If I did this, this, and this, and wrote a song here, here, and here, it would be a whole story arc. Okay. And that, I think that's the first time I ever thought, right, I need to write a song that tells this tale, and I need it to be this kind of tempo to fit in with an album here. Mm. So that was really interesting for, for me. Um, it's kind of, it's, uh, mostly I write songs with feelings that are in me, where I am in my head, and I just write a song. Um, and then I'll put them together on an album. But that was very much okay. Let's see if I can write some songs to measure to made to measure to fit these little gaps. Wow. It worked really nicely, and I love that album. And the thing I did with that album, just to change it up, I played the Saturn. There's no guitars on it. Okay. There's no guitars on the album. Well, there's a bass guitar. I lie. There's a bass guitar, but you know what I mean. Yeah. There's no um, electric guitars, acoustic guitars. I, um, the, yeah, the, the sound. I I found a nice sound with the sitern and the bass and the percussion and the violin oh, wow. and together it made a really surprisingly powerful sound considering there's no guitars involved um, yeah. and there's some moments in that album you just think oh I love that and I've said that about your own music I hope so yeah absolutely yeah why you've got to love your own if, music haven't you? otherwise if why you are you making it for goodness exactly sake, yeah. if you can't yeah. say it yeah absolutely it. so um, yeah I mean there's that one the Norglum one was very much well um I just started doing those improvisations and um, I'd been reading um, a Celtic um, fiction book, actually. And in there, it was um, some that had um, some of the early Christian monks um, who uh, kind of Celtic Christianity, what they would do is they would go and um, they would harvest a branch from uh, nine different trees nine different types of trees and they would burn them together and make an ash and that ash will be used in ceremonies. A bit like Ash Wednesday now for Christians. Um, mm -hmm. I think it is. Um, and they would use that in ceremonies. 
So that was obviously one kind of ceremony, but actually for the monk, each time they went to each of those trees, that was a ceremony itself where they actually harvested the wood. So when they went to oak, they would not only just take the oak, but they would meditate on aspects of God that they associated with an oak tree. So maybe okay. that's strength and power. And, you know, so uh, each of the trees has got a different not flavor. Uh, it's got different, um, I don't even know what the word is now, uh, attributes, attributes, okay. I guess, um, of of the Godhead, of the Trinity, of you know, and it, which you, you can meditate upon. So, and then, so I, I then wrote an instrumental for each of those nine trees. Right. Um, and for me, if no one had listened to that album, it would have been a shame. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it wasn't that what the point was. I needed that. This was the album in first lockdown where I just needed to centre myself again. And for yeah. me, that creation of each of those songs was a bit like the monk going and harvesting that tree and meditating upon those aspects of God while he was harvesting that tree. And actually, okay, the whole village would then benefit from the ash at the end of it yeah. in the ceremony. But actually the biggest part of that was the, was the creation in the creation process in the first place. Yeah. So for me, the creation of the album was, was actually more important in a way than what I ended up with. Yeah. I don't that's know. symbolic no that's amazing whatsoever so but yeah every album i've done has been completely different um you know in this album new burying ground i just listened to a lot of really really old music yeah. um and some of them they're fantastic but didn't speak to me and others i heard a few bars that oh that sound that harmony oh my goodness okay let's go to the list and mine don't sound almost anything like the originals i have yeah. to say you know like, there's no point in me just aping them i was um, going to say you know, it's, the, it's, the it's, that, not, you know? it's not a bad thing but when i go for if i listen to cover versions i will gravitate to ones that do something different with it because yeah you can line up the same one but what's differentiating it if it's all done the same I, way i'm never going to get i'm never going to sing those original songs in those way no. in that original way better than they did mm. i can't i can't they no that passion it flowed from them they wrote it they they lived it it was what got them through the day in the fields it's what yeah. got them through the long days in prison or, or whatever yeah I, I can't do that but what i can do is i can change it up and make it more relevant to where we are um, and to a new generation i mean some of these songs some of the 1700s 1800s mm. um and i think they all hold up really really well in the 21st century and that is a testament to just how good the actual songs are yeah do you do you tend to um gravitate to certain types of music or stories even you know that inspire you it either it's going to sound really weird i i go through phases during the year where i could listen to certain types of music just depending no, on what the weird out there. Is uh, it, have you got anything like that any where you gravitate to certain things at certain times of the year or certain moments in your life or you know I go through phases for sure. I don't think it's on a yearly cycle, um, but I'll go into a heavy folk phase where I'm listening to Show of Hands and Seth Lakeman, mm. um, people like that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that'll be all I listen to for months on end. Mm. And, and then I'll go through a heavy rock phase yeah. or, you know, or a, a blues phase. Um, and I seem to pick up a new genre every few years. Um, I, I still haven't quite got my head around rap yet. There's a few tracks <laughs> of rap that I that really connect with me yeah. inside, but the vast majority of it passes me by. I, I confess I must be too old for it. <laughs> but you never know. In five years' time, I might have this awakening of, yeah. oh my goodness, this is actually incredible. And then I'll listen to that for three months. <laughs> yeah, solid. I think but, yeah, as you get older, you have a new appreciation for something. Anyway, you see it from a, you see it in a totally different light. So you know there might be something in that. Definitely. I, yeah, I I listened to rap yeah. back when I was about sixteen when I left school. Um, one of my mates got me into heavy metal, and then I mean it was Eminem at the time. So depending what you're classing as rap, he was what really got me into that side of it. I think it was teenage angst really are connected to more than anything so i you know i had some friends who were very much into cypress hill when i was at university oh yeah yeah and so i mean some of that is still i listen to that and it takes me right back you know yeah is, uh, well, yeah 
great stuff. Along the Black Crows. Oh, my goodness. We used to listen to the Black Crows. Oh, Black was... Crows. Again, it's one of those I think I've listened to a couple of songs, but so many of oh. my mates have said you need to listen to them. They're really like important band. And I, I've, I haven't made it there yet to, to listen to them. Yeah. Southern Harmony and Musical Companion. That's the one you want. Okay. Okay. And Amorica is very good as well. Those are the two that really speak to me. They've done lots of other albums that are good, but those two, I think, are way above. Okay. The ones, the, beauty... the ones they got famous with aren't their best albums by any stretch of the In it's... my humble opinion. <laughs> it's funny. I, I quite like saying that if there's like a big name out there or whatever. And, and because again, whenever I sort of talk about Christopher, I get eyes rolled at me because of Lady in Red. And that's actually my yeah, least favorite oh. song of his at all. If you go back to the late 70s, early 80s. But it's what enabled him to, you know, it is. make music because if you've got it something is. like. It's, it's blessing and a curse getting a famous song, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, especially and when the day, I, I can pay your wages for the next thirty years. Yeah, then you can you can experiment with stuff then. But I really, I really did enjoy the uh, the stuff that you started off with because it was again going back to it, it's telling a story rather than then just be sort of lit, littered with ballads. Right, that, go back and have a listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not one I've ever listened to. I confess. Oh, there you go. I was... out there. You can never get through it all, can you? No, especially if you like more than one genre. I think if you were just if you were just stuck in your heavy metal, yeah. you could probably get your head around quite a lot of that. Yeah, but or if you were just folk, you mm. could really go back to the roots and yeah. yeah if you got if you got an eclectic view, it's, uh, it's yeah. I think so. It's because because then again, different moods, whatever you just dip in and out of whatever takes your fancy. So, but um, I find I'm not listening to as much music now as I used to. I don't. I'm, I work from home. Um, I do ninety nine percent of my stuff from home. Mm. I don't commute. That was my big music place. Um, yeah. And at home, I rarely just put an album on and listen to it because, in all honesty, if I've got time to listen to an album at home, I've got time to be you Making know, working on my own music. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, so I, I love music. I, what I have got is a couple of radio shows, folk radio shows, that I listen to pretty much every week okay. um, because I know that they're going to be cracking. Mm. Um, there's um, my brain is temporarily leaving me. <laughs> um, Steve Clark's Strange Brew. It's okay. on a Scottish TD1 radio station. Okay. Um, he's he's got just this lovely voice that really really helps out. But he's all he he has such a crazy mix of music in there. But all of it is really good, and I always think, oh, I've got to listen to that. And then my friend John Reed has just started a, a radio show as well. And okay. um, those two together, I mean, I can sit in the same room with them and they talk about music for two hours and I don't know any of this <laughs> stuff. About. I mean, they've lived through all of it, yeah. <laughs> as far as I can tell. And I just feel so inadequate talking about music when they're around. But they've both got these radio shows and they're, they're awesome. absolutely cracking. So I try and do that and it kind of opens me to different sounds. Um, if I just listen to the albums I like, mm. I feel I've I'm not I haven't got an input of different sounds, and I think you yeah. need that sometimes. It can be a catalyst for your own stuff, even if you don't. I don't mean don't go and copy someone else's music when no. you hear it or the sound even, but it get everything you listen to gets inside you and gets mixed together, and then comes out as your music. Um, yeah. So the more music, different types of style you can listen to, um, the better. It comes out in your music. So. I might be writing a folk record, but if I listen to some metal yeah. and it touches me, that will actually come out in my folk. It won't come yeah. out like metal. No, it's all part of it. It's all part of it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I um, I'm typically a bedroom guitarist. So again, I, t I touched on the, the start of my writing journey years ago. Um, the first thing that I started writing were some lyrics to songs that I was then going to put music to and haven't. Um, yeah. I was going to be singing them in on the pub circuit around here with a band that I don't actually have and that's <laughs> that's a that's a dream which yeah, yeah. is on the back burner for now um <clears throat> but i was I, I taught myself how to play but i was very influenced by what i was listening to at the time and i wanted to replicate it and i was always kicking myself for not sounding like that not getting it right but now what i actually love doing is picking up the guitar and just literally it's it's yeah. i just come out with whatever comes out and it feels more natural and it's not something unfortunately i've got a memory like a goldfish so the next time i pick it up i can oh, replicate yeah. it i've, no, I've yeah, yeah I, i've started to do that and then i've kind of had to make notes as well because i know if i i'm not very good by ear so if i listen to it i probably still won't remember what i did 
So here I am. I just record almost everything I do, and then I chuck most of it away. I don't. I don't keep archives of it or anything. No. Like that. But sometimes you think, "Oh, that was cool." Hmm. Oh, I can't remember what it was. Yeah. And then you just rewind five minutes, and it is there. So hmm. yeah, on occasion, it saved my bacon. There's been a a little lick that I played by accident and wanted to replicate, or yeah. um, you know, you you've got some chords and you've got a couple of lyrics <clears> and you get a nice, um, a nice. Um, tune over the top and you can't quite remember the tune and it's like oh, oh no if you yeah. record if you're just recording your little session even if it's on the phone i normally do it on the phone yeah i'm not talking proper recording now. i'm literally just i i point that at my guitar and i press yeah. record and yeah. then uh, on occasion, most of the time you just go straight in the bin but on occasion it saved my bacon then i write it down and then i put it in the bin it's the beauty of the digital age so we've kind of talked about the you know the, the negative side of it in a sense but then yeah it's it's it, you know oh, there's a fabulous side of it too yeah. though isn't it yeah I, yeah I mean i wouldn't be here without it um, no i mean you can literally now um everyone's got a well not everyone's got a computer mm. most people have got a computer if you've got a computer and you can scrape together 30 quid for a, a second hand audio interface you can have free software for your um, for your door you you need a mic mm. um Preferably an instrument, although you could get away with just tapping away on MIDI on the on the computer as well. But it's better with an instrument. But literally, I mean, my first album, apart from the percussion, which is done by my friend who's got a drum studio and he did his drums in there, it was all done with one mic and guitar, you know, guitar leads. That was, yeah. you know, nothing clever. It was just an SM57, and um, my guitar's just going in. So I think people make too much of plugins mm. techniques or all sorts of different things at the end of the day you've got ears you've got stuff that makes sounds get it on there and it's surprising what you can do with very very little anything you yeah. know for almost free um you can make stuff that sounds perfectly radio playable um mm. you know well worth putting on a cd um your skills as your skills get better you'll find things that make your life easier mm. yeah but i don't think i've ever found anything that i couldn't have done with just the stock plugins in a in okay. able to for instance um but i have found stuff that makes me get the sound i want a lot quicker yeah okay. um, in my opinion I, I i know a lot of producers who would swear blind it's not true and this you can you know you can hear the warmth on this and, all, and it's great they make fantastic music yeah. You can go with that process, and I'm going to go with mine, yeah. and uh, I'm I'm really happy with it. It's brilliant, and, and di distribution. My goodness, I can I can write a song today. I can email it to someone, be on the radio in two hours if that's yeah. what you want to do, or I can upload it to Spotify or YouTube, and theoretically, millions of people can listen to it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's just amazing, and you. You, if you get the basically, there are enough people out there who will like your stuff enough to want to buy it. Yeah, I honestly believe that of any musician. The only problem is finding them. Yeah, it's it's like um, a needle in a haystack. Yeah. So through um, your through so your experience, yeah, you can put the music out and no one will listen to it because yeah. they don't know it's there. Yeah. Um, I, we're not doing massive budgets of, for marketing, are we? You know, yeah. it's, we're, we're not Universal Studios or something. Um, but that's where the social media comes in. You can mm. talk to people on social media one by one, make connections with people, get to know people, share your music with them mm. um, in a very natural way and make listeners, fans, friends. I don't even like the term fans. I Everyone who listens to my music is a friend to me they're not a nameless that's the problem with spotify and apple music mm. and all that you're disconnected from your audience sure. yeah. not friends you may get some fans you won't have supporters you won't have friends you won't have people who will actually mess they can't message you you know they don't yeah. know who you, who you are they've just got your music you don't know who they are you can't no. send them an email so that they can get to know who you are what you do there's more to me than music and actually, the stuff in my life that goes into my music 
makes the music mean more if you know what it is. Yeah. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Um, as an overall package, me as a person and my music is far more than my music. Yeah. As much as, and music is free these days. Unfortunately, you can go and listen to it wherever you like. You can get hold of it for free. And that's, you know, it's just the way it is. Yeah. You can get a free Spotify account and listen to everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's just the world is mental. Yeah. Um, but what we're now selling as musicians is ourselves. Mm. I mean, we're selling out. I mean, our personalities are what you know, what we do becoming a relatable person, mm. you know, that kind of integrity and that this is who I am and yeah. this is my music. That whole package is what people support and will buy albums for. They're not going to buy an album because they just want to download because they can't get hold of the music anywhere. No, you know, no. Um, and and I can, you know, but they will buy an album because they want to support me as an artist and they would like me to do some more music. But with Spotify and all that, that connection is completely broken, and I yes. think that's one of the worst things about it. I see it's your numbers not, go up, I suppose, but. It's faceless, like you said. Yeah, but, it, but, but you can't do anything with it. And they right. all stream. So they're not going to buy CDs. They're not going right. to buy... You know, you know what I mean? Because they've got what they want because mm. they're streaming. And the people that discover you from streaming are people who are going to continue streaming. Yeah. Mostly. There are there are some good exceptions. There are some people who use streaming to find music, love it, go to gigs, buy CDs and all that. But uh, on, on the whole, I think you'll find that's a very, very small percentage. That's very true. So, I mean... Yeah, here ends the lesson for today. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just cut that bit, I think, and just you know put it out as a bulletin. Um, there's something that you did actually that uh, which I've seen a few of them do um, over the last few years, which is how I discovered you really. Um, and you, I think you, it must have been like a Facebook ad or something that came up, and you were actually giving away like a downloadable album, I think, or a selection of songs for free. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It wasn't. I haven't really done any ads I've, I've dabbled in ads and i haven't got it anywhere have come up some yeah it came up somewhere on uh, my feed on I, twitter, I, 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 I do put it on twitter that's my big well place so maybe on there but it, um, it, i've seen people trash that kind of thing before by saying you know you're giving your music away and that kind of thing but the other thing you, you've got to get yeah. it out there haven't you you've got to it makes well, it more accessible people have got it for free already chris yeah well quite <laughs> yeah <laughs> so why don't if i give it to them as a download hmm. They get to know me, and I get to know you. And this was that. Well, I that kind of how thing, much more valuable is that than that, listening to Spotify? I found that really endearing because it's like, okay, this guy cares so much about what he's doing that he's willing to literally give it to you. But connect, yeah, like you say, connecting to it rather than yeah, going through a stream service. Yeah. You go, you you sign up for your newsletter. You go check out your website. You find your page on Facebook. You know, all of a sudden, you can then learn more about you. Um, so, but I, and I, I, I don't I, have I, millions of fans. You know, this is not who I am. I've got a small group of of people who love my music, but I know them all by name. Mm. I'm not being funny, but on my last pre-orders for this album, of all the people who pre-ordered, I think there was about two people. I was thinking, I don't know who they are. Really? It's strange. Everyone else I've had interactions with, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean it's not very scalable. And that's what I found is, you know, I can get to a certain number of people that I can have as friends if that makes any sense and yeah. actually have a meaningful relationship with um but you but i'm not going to get a million fans doing that I don't, no. that's probably okay to be honest you know what i mean um it'd be nice to be able to do it'd be lovely if you could do facebook ads and you've got loads of people just buying all your stuff but it, the, it doesn't work they make it not I'd, work I'd want, that, I'd want that on top of what i already do you yeah. know what i mean be nice yeah, to get yeah, the extra yeah. income and to make sure people are listening but actually what i want to do is have that connection it but yeah. it's really difficult with ads and things like that because um facebook ads and things like that work really well for high ticket sales mm, yeah uh, if you're selling a course for 300 dollars, actually mm. you sell one course and you've bought your ads for the, for the next three yeah. months you know yeah. what I mean? it's, um there's you sell one album and you've paid for the day's ads, possibly, yeah. depending, you know. I mean, I've got my, my albums all on my own website um, so that the vast majority of the money goes back into my 
you know, me, um, so that I can <laughs> feed the family and the cats yeah. and um, pay the mortgage and make more music. Um, the only cut that I pay is to PayPal or Stripe or whoever processes the payment. And PayPal is, oh, yes. yeah, they take a huge chunk, but you've got to have it, unfortunately. Um, yeah. But if I, but if someone buys something on iTunes, um, they take 40% right. straight off. You buy an album for, well, you don't get a choice on the album price. They put it there as eight ninety nine or whatever they want to put it as. Okay. So you've lost money there because my albums I normally put nearly twice that. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I might put an album up for sixteen pound when it's new. Yeah. Well, they'll put it under eight ninety nine. You've got no choice. They take forty percent off as their cut. PayPal take ten percent, um, and it takes six months for them to give you the money. Oh right. Okay. No, this, I mean, you're really selling it to people now. But... Yeah. I mean, seriously, guys, if you're a musician. <laughs> get your own website i'll help you do it <laughs> yeah give me the show um but you know it's, it's very but it definitely i i i i love the personal touch to it the fact that you can go on your website and you can buy your stuff you'll sign it as well you know if they buy cds you'll, yeah, you'll cool. sign them it's it's you, you don't get that um, i'm a fan i'm a music fan i have got musicians that i love and have meant so much to me and on occasion, they've gone above and beyond. Mm. Uh, Jeff Black, the American folk guy, um, mm. acoustic. Generally, when I mean, his gigs are just him standing up with an acoustic guitar, cool. yeah. recommend him. Yeah. Um, I, he, he is a bit like a precursor to Patreon, I guess. He had something called the Blacklist, and you'd pay him $30, I think it was, or something, mm. and then he'd send you the next album. So it was a kind of way of him funding the album yeah. before. You pay for it, so it's a bit like pre-orders or a bit like Patreon or something. Yeah, you pay pound a year and you get an album. You know, I did this thirty dollars, and he sent me from the states um, three of the album. He sent me a whole bag of plectrums, Jeff Black plectrums, and he sent me a T-shirt. Wow! And I'm thinking, you made no money on that. You made literally <laughs> no money on that whatsoever. But he got a fan for life. Absolutely. Yeah. You know what I mean? And there's been a few artists that have done stuff like that. And as a music fan myself, I mean. I I love music. I love musicians, and I count myself as a fan rather than you know. We're no, we're no different to anybody yeah. else. We're all music fans. We wouldn't be in it if we didn't love yeah. that. Well, what would I like my favourite musician to do for me? Mm. Yeah, I'd love to chat to them. I'd love to be able to message them and get a reply back. I'd, yeah, you know, I'd love to if I could buy an album. I'd love for it to be signed. Yeah. Actually, I'd like a thank you note in there. Oh, you, know, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'll buy a T-shirt. I would like it personally wrapped by yeah. by a company in a plastic bag. No. I, I would, you know, I put my shirts. Uh, not I've got money left. Mine. I I wrap stuff in tissue paper and I put a sticker on the top. So when you open yeah. it, you get that crinkly feel. And I write <laughs> thank you note. And I just want people to feel valued when they yeah. bought something. You know, I'm not in this to make. Um, I'm not in there to like make wads of money. Right? I. I want to provide what's a bit like a bespoke service. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, like, it's like a shop down the road rather than Morrison's or yeah. other supermarkets are available. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with supermarkets. Don't get me wrong. But you know what I mean? This, yeah. um, but if you go to a little quaint shop in the in the town, so you've probably got millions in Devon. Uh, yes. where you get stuff. That's the feel you want to be going, I want to be going for. I don't yeah. want to be mass produced. Support uh, local, shop local, local, whatever it is. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Real people. You want that kind of realness don't you yeah yeah do you have you ever gig this far down have you if you no. come down to sort of west country i've only been to devon once and that was last week oh really <laughs> yeah I, I didn't tell anyone i mean it's really bad form to put on social media or go on a holiday and then leave your house empty so i <laughs> just, went, I just went quiet for a week oh, yeah. um, but we, all, we all went down to um a little place near kingsbridge in devon um for a week Very nice. friends came down with us we borrowed a minivan because um there are um i've got to count them now there are eight of us in the family at the moment mm. um and we have some friends as well so we we've got a seven seater s max because mostly we don't need to put everyone in at the same time yeah. um, so we borrowed a friend's um minibus and we went down and uh, wow. we had a look roads there oh my god no, they are boring. yeah like they're absolutely crazy they're I mean, there was roads we were going down where the hedgerows were touching both sides of the van as we were driving yeah. down. And you couldn't see more than 10 feet ahead of you because it was a winding hill. <laughs> and you're up in front of up a hill thinking, how am I going to yeah. make this? And 
Uh, it was quite an experience. It's great. But, um, yeah. We were really lucky because Leicester um, finished school a week before Everyone the whole country. That's so cool. there wasn't any crowds. Um, it was it was pretty much empty, really. It's, yeah, and yeah. We had the sunshine, and it was really good because we've had about three holidays cancelled in the yeah. last couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> so, Let's get on the other side of that. I was going to say... Yeah. If you, uh, if you, um, yeah, never lovely, but I've never gigged there. <laughs> you need to, well, I mean, if, if the demand is, it's your type of music, I think, is, I mean, it, it, it several ever, suited it? that, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, if you ever gravitate, I'll keep an eye on it. If you ever gravitate down to here, I'll make sure I'm there. Don't worry. Lovely. So, thank you. I will, um, I will wrap it up. I've got a few quick fire questions just for fun, just to kind of, <laughs> um, finish off. So, I can't um, there will be quick fire answers that's all right don't worry don't worry uh, first you, uh electric or acoustic depends on the mood <laughs> if i'm just taking it if i'm taking it in the car somewhere um i just want to play acoustic cool. other times i love my electric for the for the melodic work sure it's not cool. so much the sound it's, it's what you can do with it okay cool cool uh vinyl or cd <sighs> I'm, uh, most of my stuff is, is CD but I do have vinyl and on my bucket list is making vinyl that, I will put a record out that's cool you do cassette as well I've noticed that have you ever I've done one lot of cassettes and, yeah uh, I made like 20 of them and I sold about 10 of them oh. I made of them. that's all right <laughs> I just wanted to do it. That's why I did it. I, I thought I think professional cassettes. Honestly, these are great. Honestly, so much fun. I think it's brilliant really when vinyl good. when vinyl started to make the comeback. Secretly in my head, I was like, oh, "I'd be great if someone did tapes," you know. And then steadily, a few, a yeah, few yeah, more yeah. DRs. Brilliant. So, but the yeah. sound to that takes you back. You hear a yeah. tape, you think, "Oh, yeah, it's different." It's what you remember. That's what I. Grew I think up it's on. good, but yeah. I just remember putting the pencil through just to try and wind it all back up again and everything. They were more trouble than they were worth, really, but good fun. Um, a bit cliche, this one. Three things to take on a desert island. I don't know to take my wife. Depends if you close as a thing. Company. So, wow. Well, <laughs> I don't know how to phrase that. Ob objects, items, I don't know. You, it's up to you. Well, there we go. I, I would take Abby. Uh... <laughs> you're my best friend and we do uh, get on well um, you survived uh, what else would I, take? I would take an acoustic guitar um, am I allowed a free bag of strings with that because I don't think it would last very long in the heat <laughs> in the heat uh, maybe you could probably sort of hide my way somewhere yeah get away with um, I think on a desert island I would like a boat not to get away from the desert island but just to go out into the water, you know, just a little raft or a canoe or something, and then right. sit in the water. Sounds good. Sounds right. good. It's a technically by the island. You could have it on the island, I suppose. But no, I'm not giving you another free one. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it is. It's a great one, I think. Um, it, if your house was on fire, which I, I sure hope it doesn't, this close to moving, um, which instrument would you save specifically? My violin. My, I've got two violins. One was the one that I've been playing since I was about 13, when I could pick up a proper violin, um, full size. I don't know if that age is right. And I've been playing that on and off for lots of years. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll never sell that. It's part of me. But the last few years, I upgraded and I sold a whole load of instruments and then bought one of Phil Beer's uh, violins that he wow. was selling. So he used it for many years, and now I'm playing it. And every time I pick it up, I, you know, I think, like, oh, this is Phil's. This That's is Phil's. cool. Uh, it's, yeah, lovely. It's a lovely violin, but actually there's something about having someone of his stature play it yeah. for so long that actually it's quite inspirational, really. So, yeah. That is. That's brilliant. One of my um, um, sort of first occasions that I saw a show of hands, they were doing, it was a launch, a launch sort of free acoustic gig, in an independent music shop in Exeter, um, yeah. for their their Roots album, the the best of album. That's a album. I love it. Yeah, I, I didn't have any. I was like, yeah, I didn't have any of their stuff before that, and I had seen Steve Knightley support Seth Lakeman not before, so uh, not long before. So that's how kind of discovery yeah. they were. But they did a set of about sort of three or five songs, and one the I think the one of them that really did get me was um, the Blind Fiddler. 
you know, and seeing Phil do that, that was, yeah, it was Amazing. cool. There's literally yeah, like I, saw, 20 I, saw in, I saw him in a little uh, venue called The Maze in Nottingham. Really good venue. Um, it wasn't big, but the sound was fantastic and it was packed with people and everyone there loved music. Yeah. You could just tell it was a lovely, lovely venue. And I did play there once, but it's closed down. Oh, real, real shame. There's a lot yeah. of venues closed down. We, there you um, go. My wife and I were fortunate enough, um, literally in our village, we, we live in, in a town called Newton Abbott, we've got part of it, it's just a little village up the back, and they got a village hall and they had Sean Lakeman and Catherine Roberts. Oh, they're excellent. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, it was yeah. I, literally, I, I, I think there was about 70 people there. And it was it was the most amazing thing, really, just having them literally up the road and, and intimate they people like that. They are proper folk. Their music yeah. is all so spooky and violent and it is it's just it spitingly in places. It's some of the videos they've done. Oh my yeah. life! Really, really good. Love it. If, yeah. if I could, if I could have a sound like any guitarist, it's him. You know, I, I could listen to him all day. He's exceptional, isn't he? he really he is. is. Um, final one, music-related question. This is really because I'm I'm just interested in this kind of thing from a songwriter angle. What tends to come first, the lyrics or the music? Uh, they both come together. I can't do one without the other. Okay. Um, often I'll have a germ of an idea of a song, but I can't write. I can't really write it without, without a guitar. No, true. And occasionally, I, um, I occasionally I've been sat in the queue in Audi, <laughs> you know, picking up my potatoes, and I'm, I've had a tune go through my head. And said, oh, now I've got to repeat that in my head for the next. <laughs> hour till i get home before i you know i mustn't forget this tune it's really good uh, uh, occasionally and then i'll find some lyrics and try and mash it together but yeah i i do a thing where um i write songs for people okay like buy one on the website basically <laughs> so you can either give me a person and tell me all about them so whether it's your your loved one or your mum that would be a loved one you know what i mean um yeah. or or whatever you want to write a song about and and um i'll do that kind of ask them some questions and then write a song or occasionally they'll give me lyrics that they've written of any kind of song and i'll i'll make a song out of it and on occasion that's really smooth and lovely and on occasion mm -hmm. you lyrics and you think i can't get anything to scam with these right <laughs> you're not the one who's actually written the lyrics you, no you know i suppose I mean? so, yeah and just having a bunch of lyrics, I think is a good starting place for me. Mm. But it would probably, I'd probably end up with something completely different by the end of it. Sure. Okay. And that makes perfect sense. I can understand that. There's one thing before I open the floor to you. The last thing that I normally do on here is I'll give you a couple of minutes, literally just plug everything, you know, tell people where yeah. you <laughs> find you and everything. But there is one thing I wanted to say, and I was meant to slot it in when we were talking about sort of album um sort of makeup and, and construction that kind of thing and um one thing that really really is important to me and i'm sure a lot of uh, a lot of people who listen to albums as albums is that opening track and i just had to say buen camino is one of the best opening tracks i think i've heard for oh. a long long time it was it's literally i i i was at the first time i heard it i was cleaning the house i always have to have music on and it's been the only one where i've been walking around clicking my fingers to Oh, fantastic! I was. Well, that, uh, that one's got a little funny story, actually. Oh, we, go on then. I wrote that one when I and um, we just adopted the two girls, and one of them was three, yeah. and um, she had a bit of a speech impediment. It's a lot better now, um, but couldn't really pronounce. Well, she's only three anyway, but yeah, some, mm. it was, some of her, the pronunciations were very funny, very cute, right. um, and so Buen, Buen Camino has got. The, the phrase I'm going to throw my boots away in it and she would say can we have throw my boots away it's called throw my boots away but actually with with the way she talked it was actually throw my booze away <laughs> so she it was basically she'd have her friends in the car and I'm like can we have throw my booze away like as if I was some kind of recovering alcoholic or you know I, I, I might have been but I didn't want her saying that <laughs> Oh, but that, uh, that makes brilliant. you remember it for other reasons. That is brilliant. Uh, 
Listen, Matt, this has been amazing. Thank you so, so much for your time. No, no, literally, right. Where can people find you and find your music? Everyone who watches and listens to this has to go out and listen to anything (laughs) they can of yours. But where can they find it? Where can they follow you? First of all, if you've made it this far an interview, thanks. That's great. (laughs) You're hardcore. Well done. I don't know how to take that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Well, I have a website, mattsteady.com. And on there, you can listen to all my albums all the way through for free. Okay, it's not quite as convenient as Spotify, but try it. It's good. And then, I, and um, if you also on there, if you'd like a free CD, I've got a free CD. You pay for postage, just so I don't actually bank my bankrupt myself. <laughs> my financial manager, um, which is me, won't have to give me a slap. Um, but oh, there's a free download of it on there as well. And that's like a buffet menu. Uh, it's like a menu. It's got eight tracks on there, and it, each of them is from a pretty much a different album. So you can listen to tracks. Oh, I like that one. Perhaps I'll go and listen to this album. Or perhaps I'll go and listen to this album if I like that one. So it kind of gives you uh, not only you know, some free music, but kind of gives you an idea of where you might want to go to next if you like that. Um, but I'm fairly active on Twitter and Facebook. Um, so look me up, Matt Steady. Uh, on Twitter, I am Matt Stoic Steady. It's an old fight name, but we won't go there. Um, Another time. Send me a message. Um, I uh, send me an email. Uh, my email is mattsteady at mattsteady.com. Uh, hook me up on Facebook. Have a chat. I love chatting with people, and I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love Brilliant. to introduce you to my music and uh, get to know you as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, mate. Yeah. Good luck with everything. You know, are, are you hitting the road? You got plans to hit the road again at any point when things open I up? I've got any gigs planned. I've just done one at the Musician in Leicester, which is a venue that I've been wanting to play for donkey's years. Mm. And I didn't want to do it as an open night open mic night which i don't i've got nothing against open mic night so you know, but i wanted to do it as a proper gig if that right. makes any sense and, um, yeah. and it got offered to me so i thought, oh god i did it and it was the first gig i'd done in two years wow. and it was fabulous i had so much fun i really did um as i said i'm picking and choosing at the moment mm. we're moving house we've got um I'm not got going all the kids here and it's hardly even on my vent it's hardly even on my radar gigging so yeah. if you want me to come play Give me a shout. <laughs> I'm not actually kind of searching for gigs at the moment. Does that make any <laughs> sense? But any any of my Devon listeners and that, you know, let's let's do what we can to get Matt down here. <laughs> Absolutely. So listen, thank you again so much. This has been a blast, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um You're very welcome. I'll uh, you know, we'll we'll keep in touch um yeah, over, over the veil and um, you know, I'll be I'll be definitely looking out and supporting what you're doing. So uh Thank I'll you for the something. music and thank you for your time. The album, you know, I'll do that when I come off, actually, because it's, yeah. it's out there. Cool, cool. Thank All you, right. mate. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to like, share and hit the subscribe button. Also follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Dead Men's Tales Pod to keep updated about all future shows.